Hey y'all and welcome back to my channel. I made a video of myself talking about Newport Academy uh, about two years ago and I just wanted to do like a follow-up and include some more details that I left out and I don't know kind of explain my perspective now that it's been almost three years since I've been there. So first of all Newport Academy if you're watching um, everything that I am going to say is absolutely true. I'm not using names of anyone so um, take from this video what you will and if you are um, considering Newport Academy I highly suggest um, watching my other video and um, reading reviews from other kids that have been there and parents and everything like that. On my other video about Newport Academy, about a year ago, I clicked the little notification bell and there was a comment from Newport. I was like, oh my God. And so I clicked it and then I couldn't see it. So they had commented on my video and then deleted it. And I don't know what they commented to this day, but they were smart enough to delete it. So if they see this video, hey guys. Another thing I wanted to mention that I didn't know when I made the last video was so I was a lot of this won't make sense if you didn't watch the other video so if you're considering Newport and you want like a background maybe go watch my other one first um, but the IOP I was going to before I went to Newport this is very interesting um, in 2020 they went to visit Newport and originally I thought that they had no ties to Newport whatsoever and I found that a little strange that they did have this connection to them now. Just a thought in my head, I don't know. I don't know if it has to do with anything, but I thought it was a little bit weird. All right, let's get right into it, I guess. So I'm gonna start by talking about the medical aspect of it. Uh, and this begins with my diagnosis. So I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder um, and depression. So those were the two things I was diagnosed with before going there. I had a psychiatrist, I had an outside therapist, I had an IOP counselor that agreed, and I had another psychiatrist from the IOP that agreed that those were my only two diagnoses. So I go to Newport and again they don't do an intake evaluation at all. They take you and then they talk to you about everything. So I kind of explained to them what was going on and later we got the records back. There was this whole ordeal um, where I did get these records back and they had diagnosed me with bipolar disorder and nowhere else in these files did it say anything about me having bipolar disorder. None of the psychiatrists I'd seen before or after Newport thought that I had bipolar disorder so they misdiagnosed me there and that could have been bad if I'd stayed longer than I did. Okay, now I want to transition into talking about the lack of medical attention that I received while I was there. Um, so in my other video, I talked about um, getting stepped on by a horse and I was just re-watching my other video and I was so earnest when I was talking about it. I was like, this horse, her name was Sassy and she stepped on me and like the horse's name is so irrelevant. Her name was Sassy and she was Sassy though. She girl had an attitude. Um, so yeah, we're doing this like a game or something where you like lead the horse through a maze or something weird and and then we all gathered back up and the horse kind of followed and it stood on my foot and I was like yelling. I was like, oh my god, oh my god. And no one was paying attention to me except for um, my bestie Kristen, my, my roommate. She was like, guys, there is a horse on her foot. And they were like, oh, okay. And they, they, got, they got sassy off, but it was only maybe 30 seconds, but that is still enough pain to last for days. I mean, horses are like a thousand pounds. Like that shit really, really hurt. So I started crying after that from the physical pain. You know, I was doing pretty well with being dropped off. I thought I was gonna be fine and not cry until later, but the physical pain of this made me cry. I thought I had broken my toes. Um, I really probably should have gone to the doctor. They didn't take me to the doctor. They didn't offer me any medicine, any Tylenol or ibuprofen or anything for the pain of that. Um, which is a red flag. A again, with the little to no medical attention, they didn't give me my antidepressant for four days, and I talked about that in my last video. Um, and they basically didn't give it to me until 
they basically weren't going to give it to me until the fifth day like they had already missed the fourth day giving it to me at medicine time or whatever so they were going to give it to me the next day but my mom called them and and she was like no you are giving her this medicine right now she's already been off of it for four days you drop the ball she's taking it right now so they did this weird thing called like a reiki and I'm not really into that kind of spiritual healing stuff, but basically I was laying on the couch and this woman was like rubbing her hands with essential oil over me and something about my chakras being out of line, whatever. The nurse came in with my Cymbalta and I finally took it um, after four days without having it. So yeah, I also had the pleasure of getting my period while I was there and I get really, really bad cramps and I've gotten that sorted out now. So now I take birth control for that and it helps with my cramps so much. Um, but at this time I was not taking birth control for my cramps at all. I was just taking ibuprofen and Tylenol and using heating pads all together and taking hot baths and stuff like that. Like heat helped, but I really needed ibuprofen. So we're sitting at the dinner table or the lunch table. I think it was lunch actually. I was just bent over in pain. I could not eat. It hurt so bad. And I was like, y'all, can I please go get some Tylenol? Can I please go get a heating pad, something? And they're like, yep, yeah, but you have to follow the rules like every everyone else. And you can't get up from this table and, until like 45 minutes have passed. And I was like, guys, I'm in excruciating pain right now. We're all girls here. Um, we all have a period. You know how bad cramps feel. Like, can I please just go get some medicine? They're like, no, you have to wait. So I sat there in pain and waited it out. And then I went to like the nurse practitioner person who gave the medicine, but wasn't really a nurse. I don't know. It was a very odd situation. There was a little booth. So I went to the little booth and I said, I have really bad cramps. Can you help me? Can I have some Advil? Um, and she was like, no, but you can have this, um, this, I can't remember if she gave me the Advil or not. I have a feeling she didn't. I have a feeling that she did not give me the Advil because she gave me this little like pack. It was like a, like frozen peas, but hot kind of, and you would shake it. It was like a hand warmer, but it was bigger than that. And you'd shake it and put it like on your stomach as a heating pad. And so doing that, and it would go cold in like 10 minutes. So I had this like cold bag um, pretty much. And I don't think I had ibuprofen. So they didn't really take care of that either, which was an issue because I have really bad cramps and I was really in pain. And I couldn't focus on anything because I was in so much pain and they wouldn't give me the medicine, the reasonable medicine that I was requesting that my mom and dad had approved. All right, now I want to talk about some of the um, standard procedures, I guess, that they do there. Um, so I'm going to start out by talking about AA and NA. So that stands for Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, if you didn't know that. Um, and so anyone there with drug abuse or alcohol abuse or anything like that was allowed to go to these meetings. Oh, and they also had Al-Anon, which is for kids with alcoholic parents. Um, and they would be taken in a bus to this meeting like once or twice a week or something and pretty much everyone there uh, Met the requirements to go to one of those meetings except for me and one other girl and basically If we didn't have a group or anything to do We just had to waste time doing whatever stupid activities the um, caretakers decided like instead of letting us like watch a movie or play a board game or something, they insisted that we read a book out loud to each other, page to page. Maybe even paragraph to paragraph. We read Holes, which is a book for like elementary schoolers or middle schoolers, and we traded off reading paragraphs for like an hour or two until they got back. Like they were just wasting our time and it just like, like what? Just let us do something fun or let us do what we want to do. Like I mean, there's nothing, like, harmful about that. I just thought it was kind of strange that they didn't have anything more anxiety and depression um, focused that we could have been doing while the other kids were focused on their other issues. Um, I also wanted to talk about the food situation there. So we had three meals a day, three snacks a day. Um, the snacks were, it was usually just fruit, and sometimes it was like pirate's booty or something like that, or like healthy chips. You could only have two snacks. So like whenever it was snack time, so I could only have two apples. 
and then we had three meals a day. It wasn't very kid-friendly food, and I don't want to complain a lot about it, but it was very fancy California food. Um, a lot of kids didn't like it, including me. I'm a super picky eater, and I was very, very worried. I also have allergies, and so I was super hesitant to eat anything that had been cooked in a place that I didn't no, without a label to read or anything, I had to just blindly trust and hope and pray that none of the allergens were in this meal. And they actually were pretty good about that. They took me um, to meet the chef and to see the kitchen and everything. And I didn't see any of my allergens present, but then again, it was a whole kitchen and it was this new man I had just met and I was scared. And every time we'd have a meal, he would write a note with the ingredients in it, which was so kind. I love the chef there. He was so nice. He was so accommodating, great guy. I was just really nervous to eat and I kind of wish that they had worked with me um, on that because you know, some people are there for eating disorders and some people aren't. And so people's meals don't all need to be the same in my opinion. Um, so anyways, because the food was so not good, people were dropping weight very quickly. And if you dropped weight, you had to take a protein shake. And luckily I wasn't there enough to have to take a protein shake, but I was losing weight like crazy because I wasn't eating the food. Um, and I don't know how they didn't notice, but they didn't notice. So I was basically surviving off of the cereal we were allowed to have in the morning and like three apples a day, um, which I know is kind of my choice, but with my allergies and having an anxiety disorder, I wish that they would have um, allowed me to um, pick food, maybe go to the grocery store with them and pick on agreed food that they could give me instead so that I could read the label. But no, that was never a thing. So because of this food issue, if you didn't go into the facility with an eating disorder, there's a good chance you walked out of it with one. Um, just the way that they talked about food or the lack of talking about food or just all the circumstances around when we got to eat and what we got to eat were so weird that when I got out, I, I was so like conditioned to this weird routine of like picking at this like gross food and eating apples all the time. And like, I know I was only there for nine days. I was, but that's enough to get conditioned to something. And so when I got out, I, it was, it was hard and I ate and ate and ate and I gained a lot of weight because while I was there, I felt like my food was so restricted that when I got out, I had to just make up for it. And that is not a good thing. Drug test you every other day. I don't know if I mentioned that in the other video or not. Regardless of if you're there for drugs or not, you have to pee in a cup every other day. And it's really gross. Like I've been drug tested multiple times, negative every time. Um, for IOPs and stuff and for this residential, they would leave a tray out just sitting in the hallway with everyone else's like cup of pee just like sitting there. And it like it smelled bad. It was so freaking gross. And I had to like walk past that and go put my cup on there. And it just didn't really make sense to me how anyone could be doing drugs when we were being watched 24 7. Like, how what? We didn't have technology. It's not like we could call a drug dealer. Like it just didn't make sense at all. And it was kind of like demeaning and degrading and, you know, showing that they don't trust us at all. Um, it was just odd, I think. The next thing I wanted to talk about were the letters again. So I talked about that in my last video because that was like one of the worst parts of it for me was not being able to communicate with my family and friends. Um, so to stage up, and to be able to communicate with friends, you'd have to write a letter pretty much explaining all of your good behavior and why you deserve to be staged up. And they would decide on if you're good enough or not to stage up. And that's pretty messed up to me because I feel like you should be able to stage up whenever you're exhibiting the behaviors of, you know, the next stage or whatever, if you're being responsible. Um, and I was listening to this true crime podcast the other day and someone was talking about how prisoners have to write letters to to ask for an appeal, kind of. Uh, not that's not, and it's not the same thing. Obviously, it's not the same thing. 
but it felt really similar. Like we're writing these letters, like begging to get to the next stage so that we could get out of there. And these prisoners are writing letters, begging for an appeal so that they could get out of there. And that just, that parallel just like clicked in my head. And that's just so sad. It's just so messed up. All right, the next thing I wanted to talk about was AWOL. Um, so I mentioned that they take your shoes for the first 72 hours. And I've heard from a few people that they've stopped doing that. Again, I've not been here since Janu I've not been there since January of 2019, and they have possibly they they may have changed all of these procedures by now. I don't know for sure. I want to make that very clear. I'm speaking from my experience from January 2019. And in January of 2019, they would take your shoes for the first three days so you wouldn't AWOL. And everyone said AWOL all the time. And I, maybe I'm just dumb, but I didn't know what it stood for. Okay, absent without leave is what it stands for. And I should have known that. But just the way that they call it AWOL makes it sound like a military boot camp and not like running away or something like that. It just, it just, the word AWOL is just so intense for a girl you know, walking down the street of this very nice um, neighborhood in Southern California. All right, I also wanted to talk about the phone calls. So I talked about how you get a five minute phone call um, with your parents in the like orientation stage or whatever. What I think I failed to mention was that there was a care coordinator person um, sitting right there that could hear the call, hear everything you say. And if you said anything about wanting to go home, anything along those lines it would hang up the phone so basically i was not allowed to um speak my mind uh the first groups i had was process group and this was not a process group i was used to so in iop we process about the stuff that was like going on in our lives our issues um give advice to each other now this process group was not about any of our issues it was basically a big circle um, so that the kids in the house could call each other out for things. So one person would say, hey, you, I know you did this. Why did you do that? That was stupid. And they'd be like, I didn't do that. I don't know what you're talking about. And it was pretty much that for an hour. And I kept trying to intervene and say like, hey, guys, like, I know I don't know you that well, but like, let's just take a deep breath. And it was just like pinning us against each other pretty much like there was no form of camaraderie there at all I don't know what the point of that group was at all honestly okay now I'm going to talk about some of the experiences I had while I was there um more than I did in the last video and already have um so they take away pretty much anything sharp anything that could harm you um but this one girl came up to me and was like look like I I self-harmed last night and I was like oh my god, how? Like, what? Why would... What? And she was like, yeah, I took um, an eraser and just rubbed it on my leg until, you know, it... I don't want to go into detail or anything, but she showed me and I was like, oh, like, why Why are you doing that? Like, and it, it, it makes sense for some kids. I mean, I think I agree with taking away anything sharp. I absolutely agree with that. But it was just scary the links that some people would go to to do things like that and to break the rules like that. Um, yeah, just a little intense. And I understand self-harm because I struggled with that for a long time. But it was just kind of shocking that that happened in a treatment facility, I guess. Um, so going back to, I'm sorry, this is so out of order. But going back to when I was talking about food and my allergies and everything. So there was a family day on Saturday where I got to see my mom and dad in person. And the chef was there and I got to talk to him and I told him, you know, I'm not eating enough. I'm still nervous. And he gave me a granola bar that was my allergen free. And I was eating it during this like parents day. And this, this family therapist who I hadn't even met yet walks up to me and starts yelling at me and yelling at my mom. And why did you bring her food? You can't eat food from outside. What, like, what are you doing? Why are you eating that? And we were like, dude, the chef just brought it to me to to eat like and she like she like didn't believe me almost it was really bizarre and my mom had to like get involved and bring the chef over it was weird it was weird 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 now before going over for family day um we had to do these things called contraband checks which basically they didn't want any 
physical contact with you, which is good, but they would pretty much make you like pat yourself down, snap your bra strap, um, snap your waistband, pull your pockets inside out and take off your shoes to make sure you weren't like bringing your parents anything, I guess, which like, it's again, it's not like we would have drugs there. Like I kind of understand on the way back, you know, in case your parents brought you something dangerous, but on the way there. So I was dumb. I was 16 and I didn't think it through and there's no way I could have known about the shoe thing, but I wrote letters. I wrote one letter to this guy I liked at the time that I was going to ask my mom to mail and I wrote another letter to both of my parents explaining why I thought this facility was wrong for me because I knew that when I saw them I'd just be a hot mess and crying and missing them and just wanting hugs and not having to talk about all of it. So I wrote it down so it would be, you know, more um, easily understandable and my feelings could be conveyed better. Um, and so I take off both my shoes and one of the letters falls out and the other one stays and they take it. And of course, the letter that falls out is the letter to my family, not the less important one to the boy that I like. So I still have that letter, actually, because I never mailed it. Um, but I said, okay, well, if you're going to take this from me and not let me have it, can I throw it out? And they were like, no, we'll throw it out for you. And I saw them hand it over to another care coordinator, and she just started reading it. She just started reading it. And she was standing by the trash can, so I assumed that she was going to throw it out after she read it. But no, 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 no. Uh, so during this family day thing, um, when the family therapist came over um, about the granola bar, uh, she came over again later and said, Oh, I see you wrote a note to your parents, and uh, you're really angry. You said the F word a lot of times. And I was, like, jaw-dropped. I was like... I told them to throw that out. How the hell did you get your hands on that? That was private. That was supposed to be to my parents because you wouldn't let me, you know, express my true feelings over the phone. I had to do it some way. And through writing was the way that made the most sense to me. And I was just utterly disgusted that she had read it and that they had lied to me. And my mom was as well. And she went up to one of the CCs and was like, I need that letter. My daughter wrote that letter to me and I need it. And she was like, there's nothing I can do. Like, I can't get that letter for you. Like, the therapist has it. So to this day, I don't have the letter. And I, I, I mean, I know the basis of what it says, but I thought that was just really cruel to, um, to take that away from me and to lie to me and to not let me express my feelings. So this Parents' Day was on a Saturday and our family session was on a Monday. And on Monday, um, my mom and dad and I met with a family therapist, the one that had yelled at me and read my letter that I did not trust whatsoever. And during the session, I was like, hey, I want to talk about why I'm here and I really don't think I need this level of care. And she was like, nope, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the issues you have. And I was like, okay, well, the big issue right now is that I'm here and I don't need to be here and it's doing more harm than good. She would not listen to me. She kept changing the subject. It got so frustrating. And when the session finally ended, we were walking out. The CC was like escorting me out. And I pretty much grabbed my mom and pulled her into the bathroom with me and locked the door because I could not get a moment alone with my parents. I was being watched like 24 seven, like watched like a hawk. Like it was very intense. And I said to her like, you have to get me out of here. I, I, I cannot keep doing this. This is harming me more than helping me. Please, God, get me out of here. Um, and that was the only moment alone I could have with her, really. So she, she said that she talked to my dad about it and that she would try to get me out sometime that week um, once they had talked, once my mom and dad had talked. And I was like, okay, please please, please, as soon as possible, please. And she's like, okay. Now the bathroom was kind of my safe place there. It was really the only place I could be alone, kind of going back to the family day on Saturday. Um, but my mom gave me her phone um, and I went to the bathroom and I called my best friend and I called the guy I was talking to at the time. I was like, hey, this is so bad. Like, I really want to come home. Like, I miss you guys so much. Um, which, yeah, that was breaking the rules. That absolutely was breaking the rules. However, they had lied to us. So did I feel bad about it? No, absolutely not. 
um, they said I could have contact with my friends and, and family through writing, and they would not allow me that, so I was going to have contact with my friends and family. If that was over the phone, it was over the phone. So the Tuesday after the session, my mom took me out, and I finally got all of the letters that my family had been writing to me, and I read them all in the car, and it made me really sad, but it was nice to know that they cared enough to write. Um, I just didn't know it at the time. And so after the after effects of this experience were absolutely horrific, couldn't have dreamed of it. I developed PTSD, um, diagnosed PTSD from this experience. And I tried EMDR therapy and because of this really, really scary experience. That's basically what I talk about. Um, I have these horrible nightmares where I, I'm back at, at Newport and I get to drive away with my mom or a friend or just something and go get food and I'm so happy and then they loop back around to bring me back and I start freaking out I'm like how was this happening like you can't bring me back like how was this happening for a second time like how how did, how did I let that happen for a second time like that's not like how is it how is it happening again it just feels so real and I wake up like <gasps> And then I'm like, oh my God, thank God, I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not there, it's not real. But I struggle with nightmares like that a lot. A lot of nightmares where I am trapped, trapped specifically in Newport, but sometimes trapped somewhere else with some of the girls from Newport. Um, and then I wake up again, like freaked out, thinking that I'm trapped somewhere and I'm not trapped anywhere. Um, yeah, so I'm doing okay now. It's been a while since I was there. Again, they might have changed a lot of these policies. Um, I know a lot of people that have had terrible experiences there, but I also know some people that have had really good experiences there. Hey y'all, um, so I like lost the footage or something for the end of this video, so I just wanted to wrap it up. Um, if anyone is struggling, if anyone has been to Newport or is considering it, please comment below. I will definitely respond. Um, and yeah, I mean, that is my personal experience at Newport, and I hope this video helped at least one person. Um, you know, do your research, please do your research, everyone. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. Bye!